spray brushed onto the bare wood and then double silk spanned over the entire airframe. And what you're looking at right now, this blue tint, by the way, is the natural color of the dope I'm using. I use uh, Randolph's non tinted tinted uh, nitrate dope. Uh, why nitrate? My preference is because uh, it dries glass hard overnight, it's easily sandable, and the low tautening uh, doesn't shrink. It stops shrinking after a while. If, uh, you can get to a point where it's not gassing off, you don't smell the dope anymore, you're ready to sand it. Uh, as uh, testimony to how these finishes build up, by the way, I use no filler on my finishes whatsoever, as you can see. This plane was finished a year ago using the identical process that you see here. Uh, feel free to come up and look at it anytime you want. Uh, other than things that I put in it by tweaking flaps and doing whatever else we do with our stunt ships to make them fly, uh, you'll see there is not a bit of grain showing anywhere on this airplane. And uh, I've got a, four, a three and a half to four year old SV-11 home. I don't know if you, people are familiar with it, the blue one. The finish is identical to this. Four years old, still no grain. So I know the finish works. The process works very well. And in my opinion, it's one of the lightest ways to finish simply because uh, you're not putting anything on the airplane that's not necessary. Uh, it's a lot of work. Don't, I'm not going to lie to you. It's uh, probably one of the most labor intensive finishes. But uh, for this type of airplane, this thing will be flying at no more than 61 to 62 ounces. To finish an airplane like this with that type of finish and come in at that weight, you've got to have something going before the color goes on. And this, I feel this nitrate system really, really works. Uh, at this point, before I go on to the other portion of my talk, I'd like any questions anybody has about the finishing process. Can you speak to the by putting everything in line. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know. I'm, okay? The reason why I designed the airplane this way is if you look at the design itself, there's really no place else to put anything. It has to be on one line, okay? And I figured, well, we, were, we live in a symmetrical world. Let me really go symmetrical with it. The only asymmetrical portion of this airplane, of course, is the, uh, wide, the one inch longer inboard wing. Uh, and I did that just simply by extending the tip an inch and the, uh, and the anhedral in the wing. But the anhedral in the wing was done specifically to counteract the weight of the pipe on the bottom and of course the inverted engine. Uh, by the way, this, this design also solves another potential problem that you have using a pipe system and that's keeping the header and the pipe cool. I don't think we have a problem with that. Okay? Uh, the ventral fins, they're there strictly because the real one hasn't. And uh, the only concession I'm making to my original design philosophy with these jets is I'm not putting drop tanks or missiles on this particular one because uh, I really plan on this being a very serious airplane. Yes? Three questions. Three? Wait a minute. What at a time. What will you It's going to... Are you familiar with my Crusader? Okay. It's going to be the navy gray on top, white on the bottom. Uh, I'm going to be using the uh, color scheme of the, I forgot which squadron, but the squadron is based on the USS Constellation. Uh, it's the typical navy gray and white. There'll be a red, white, blue chevron diagonally on the nose. Uh, the runners will have a very deep navy blue and cold and gold star motif, as well as the, um, the ventral fins. And the usual, you know, jet intake and jet paraphernalia on it. Yes? Uh, I buy it locally on Long Island, a place called Candle Aviation Supply in Bohemia, Long Island. Uh, because that, where you see that brake line, let me let me hold the airplane up. And, all right, I'm sorry. He asked me why there were so many hinges on the outside portion of the uh, flaps. If you see uh, over here, there's, there's a, uh, a line on that flap. That's going to be a brake line. That's going to be a trim tab on the outboard section of the wing. And the inboard section, if you see a similar line, that's going to be a fixed, uh, it's just going to be actually a fixed portion of the wing. It'll be an extension of the wing. Any other questions? The back. Yeah, Vic, uh, instead of using filler, as you say, you don't use, uh, you concentrate on building your substrate by adding an extra layer of uh, 
so expensive? Or? No, what I, what I do, and uh, I have to compliment my friend Wendy on this. Where is he? Boy, the first compliment he gets today, he's not even around again. Uh, wood to wood fits are really essential in, in building. Oh, here he is. I just complimented. You weren't even around to get it. <laughs> wood, wood to wood fits are really, really essential to this type of building and flying if you want to have it light. You can't make up for bad fits with filler or anything else because uh, there's a phenomenon known as the, you know, we have young people here, the crap fairy that creeps into these things. And uh, before you know it, you'll weigh all your parts. And, even, and once you put the airplane together, even if you weigh the glue, for some reason the plane will weigh 10 ounces more than you figured it to. And that's as a result of bad wood to wood fits because no matter what you do, you have to fill that. But getting back to your original question, uh, my entire finishing process, obviously you're not reading my finishing column in stunt news. <laughs> okay, uh, I've taken it step by step. We've, we've done it in 12 issues so far. The, once you have, you're satisfied with your wood to wood fits, you brush on three coats of nitrate clear. The uh, silk span, the double O silk span is put on top of that and what I generally do is I adhere the silk span to the structure uh, using maybe 10% dope and 90% thinner. Basically what you're using is a thinner to soak through the, the uh, silk span and to adhere to the, uh, the nitrate underneath. And then I, then I brush five to six more coats of nitrate on top of that. Now what we're going to try to do. That's block sanded back down. Now wait for the baby band job to go to the I bathroom. I spray on three to four more coats of nitrate. And then plane. Then I'm going to go over there and ask him the okay. video tape. That first sanding, you know, the first five first coats, it isn't here. You can't find it. I'll get him on the video. But I can't emphasize enough that this takes time. Right After you brush on those five, six coats of clear, yeah, and you go through your first finishing, I walk away from the airplane for at least a month. What I generally do is time my building to where uh, I'll put this airplane down, and this year I just happened to have a lot of fun building a couple of uh, half A planes for my grandson. And uh, then I went back to it. This, I sprayed, uh, the final coat of uh, clear was sprayed on this Thursday night. I will not touch this airplane again probably for another two weeks. It's a long finishing process, but there's the result of it. That airplane will look the same three years from now as it does right now. Yes? Um, it's all very, very aerodynamically designed. Now, when you design them, you put the original. Did you ever uh, have any problems regarding the, the flat air intakes on either side? But that's about the only area where I can see wind resistance. And if so, or if not, did you ever think of perhaps making them functional uh, air intakes as per cooling system to the tube pipe? I can answer to your first question. Uh, you know, that, that question was asked when I when built the first one, and to be quite honest with you, with the engine running, I, I, I didn't notice that as a problem. You know, uh, there was no pinch up or pinch down Sorry. moment associated with them, and what I attribute that to, and again, this is just a guess, I'm not an aerodynamic engineer by any means, uh, on the inner half of the propeller blade, there's a great deal of turbulence going down the fuselage, and when you have turbulence going over something like that, you have less drag. Because yeah, you, you have you you don't have a laminar flow or a smooth flow going past that that vertical piece. It's very turbulent and everything, so it doesn't give you the drag that a smooth airflow would. So uh, to be quite honest with you, I, I didn't notice any effect on the flying of the airplane. What I did notice is when the engine quits, the plane does uh, the original. Okay, I'm, I'm speaking from. 25 years ago now. Uh, the original did tend to slow down and have a, a higher sink rate than your average stunt ship. It wasn't as slippery through the air as your average stunt ship, which uh, in some circumstances I think that's good because the plane will tend to balloon less and uh, once the, the main gear on the ground and you kind of hold that nose gear down, the plane will slow down quickly. Uh, in answer to your second question, would I want to make them functional? These things are complicated enough, no. <laughs> Any more questions? Mike. Five coats you put on after the silk space. You're just knocking off bumps and stuff between them, or just build it up? Uh, the 
question is, uh, while I'm rushing on the coats of clear over the silk span, do I... Uh, I do I... the by the way, I just forgot that. Yeah, I know, Mike, you forget a lot of things. Do I knock it down? Generally, no. If I, if I see an obvious defect, I mean, there's a wrinkle in the paper or something like that, yeah, I'll sand it down. But uh, generally, what I want to do is get the buildup on the airplane. I want to get enough clear on there so that when I do sand it, I don't hit the paper. I want to sand to the paper, not through the paper. Any more questions? Before I go on to the next portion of this? Okay. One minute. Okay, is the um, is the Crusader and this airplane with the anhedral, uh, and if you're all familiar with the uh, control systems of these airplanes, uh, you can't have a you know because the control horns are a solid piece going from flap to flap, and you have an angle uh, in this control horn, you can't get this thing to travel through its normal control arc without binding. Okay, and what would happen is, it would, uh, if you're all familiar with the oil canning effect, where when you squeeze something, it'll pop in one direction, then pop the other. Well, the flaps will tend to do that, unless you come up with something that uh, will not let the uh, control horns bind. So what I've done, what I did was, I came up with a split horn system. And the way I accomplish it, this is a side view of the control horn, the flap control horn. Can you imagine the size of the plane that this thing went on? You need a big jet to fly this one. Make that uh, flight street look small. Uh, and what I did was, and you'll see it, you'll see uh, the end, when I show you the end view of this thing, it'll clarify what this is all about. This is your push rod going to the bell crank, this is your push rod going to the elevator. And what I did was, rather than make right angle bends in the, uh, in the, 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 uh, control rods or the uh, push rods, because to do that, I would be bending into just one or the other flat one. There's actually two horns here, and you'll see, you'll see when I show you the end view. And what would happen is you'd be applying all the stress to one flat one, and the other one would act as a follower. And uh, I never really made the attempt to do it because I, I don't want to even take the chance. But what would happen is you'd have one flat doing most of the work and the other one just following it, and you may get some twisting forces in there that could throw the airplane out of trim. So what I did was, I came up with this system here, and if you look at this, this is looking at the trailing, from the back of the airplane, looking at the trailing edge of the wing. This is the trailing edge of the wing, and if you notice, I've got the anhedral drawn in there, and what I did was I took two control horns, and I cut one end off each control horn. This is, the, this is the portion that goes into the flap, and this, this sticks out this way. And what I did was, the, uh, that, spade, that spade section that you saw side of, let me bring this back, I maybe to clarify. What this is here is a piece of 1 16th inch steel that's drilled out to accept a uh, 1 8th inch piece of brass with a 3 32nd ID to act as a bushing as you know, we all push our control systems. And this is the same way, and that is silver soldered to the end of that push rod. And the same thing uh, with the uh, elevator push rod. Now, all this thing, all this is acting as, as a carrier for the bushing. It looks complicated, but it really, really isn't. Uh, and at that point, rather than bending the push rod this way or that way, here is that spade section, and here is the bushing that is mounted in it. And what I do is I take a piece of 332nd music wire, the same material we make our push rods out of, run it through both control horn bushings and, the, and that spade at the same time. And then what I do is I take a couple of number two washers and solder it to the outside of each control horn. So basically what you have is a pivot rod and this bushing and the, the spade that goes to the push rod sitting right on it. And, and this is the bushing inside of that. And what I do is, and of course this goes to the top hole, 
It's the way we do our control systems. And the bottom one going to the elevator is identical. And what I do is I offset them slightly so that they, uh, they don't interfere with each other. And I put a spacer between here and here and a spacer between here and here to keep these things from riding this way. Understand that this is really, really emphasized, okay? It's drawn quite a bit oversized and it's certainly not drawn to scale. I just wanted to give you an idea how this was done. And what this does is it enables both of these platforms to move up and down without any interference in here, okay? And so that if you get the opportunity, move my control system, you'll see it's just as free as any other control system and there's no binding in the flap area. That's basically what I wanted to talk about this because I've been getting a lot of questions uh, pertaining to, uh, especially with the Crusader, because this is only five eighths of an inch. The Crusader has two inches in each wing panel, and without this type of system, that airplane can't be built and flown. Any questions? Yes. I can use the same type of luggage for the back of the uh, B-26. Uh, sure. Uh, which has the The idea behind this is to, is to enable both surfaces to move the same, but through, a, but through an off-center plane, okay? Um, one other, I did want to mention something like that. <laughs> the, oh, yes, what I did want to mention is that I'm talking about anhedral, which is a downward droop of the wings, but there's no reason why this whole thing can't be turned upside down and used on other military type airplanes for stunts such as the uh, Mustang or, or any other type of military plane you'd want to fly. Uh, yes? Excuse me? Producing these bars? Producing them? All you have to do is just take two control points and cut them. It's not a big deal. I'm sure we can work something out though. Any more questions? Okay, uh, all right. What I have to say, I'll, you'll be hearing from me again later on this afternoon. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, we tried something for the first year, first time this year, we asked vendors to bring products set up displays, or there, there's a bunch of people in this event, and they're small. But they support the event every way we can, and I think we ought to give a lot of credit for, for making the effort to come down. Uh, in the back of the room, we've got Scott Smith with uh, Daryl Smith, who does foam link cores, among other things. We also have Jim Hunt, who I think is, he's older than dirt, and he invented a lot of the stuff that we use the fly control line. And Wendy's got his stuff over here. What I'd like to do is give, give each one of them a little bit of an opportunity to step up here and explain what they brought and the services and products that they offer. Okay, now I'm going to start with Wendy because he's standing right here and he's got the camera aim. Now, now he's checking. When it's me, he didn't care with it. You know. Who cares? <laughs> pictures of the rest of the world. But Wendy's going to tell us this, and I'll go wake uh, Jim and Scott up, and, and uh, we'll give them a shot at, at uh, talking. Mike is out searching for lunch. If, if these guys don't run, you know, if, if they're, if Mike comes with the lunch, if they're still talking, uh, we're going to have the awards presentation for the stunt series right after lunch. If not, it's going to be before lunch. Okay, for anybody that's interested, I didn't bring a lot of stuff today. I don't want to uh, buy this up like uh, some kind of flea market or something. There's a couple of significant things that I have with me if anybody wants them. The saving, of course, is you don't pay for the shipping and that you have it today. I have some line reels left out in the truck. I have some of the tubing that goes over the, over the clips, which I see a lot of people don't, haven't invented that yet, haven't figured out what that is. Uh, I just got a new supply and we have a new local supplier manufacturing landing gears in all different sizes. Uh, some are Randy Smith's new spinners and these are real nice. These are probably the top of the line spinner available right now. 
have a supply of them. The belt cranks that I mold, they're glass nylon, 44%. Uh, and we still haven't figured a way of breaking one. Anyway, if, if anybody out there feels strong, if they can break this, uh, they'll be the first one. Even Big Jim can't break it. Have some handles, short arms and long ones, big ones and small ones. And I guess my spiel for two minutes is all of these products are things I manufacture, make in-house or trade with other suppliers like Randy. Uh, the other thing that, this is Jimmy's, I don't have any left. I sold the last one I had. These are 90 bucks, it's a digital readout scale. They're real nice and handy. It's an O-House LS2000 for somebody that doesn't like fooling with a grain scale. These are real handy. I usually have five of them at the shop at all times. Okay, but the biggest single thing, and I know there's people right here in the room here, I brought some videos here. If there's anybody here that uh, would like to borrow them, and I have your word that you'll either return them or buy pizza, there's I think 10 or 15 of the ones that I had extra copies of. The crash repair ones that I think are real good if anybody's interested. Basic and advanced flight trimming of planes. Uh, rather than spend $10 on a phone call, get it, make your own copies, steal them, lose them, whatever. Um, we have all the contests going back to 87, all the Nats, all the team trails, almost every local contest. So if you want to see what you looked like 10 years ago, I probably have it on video. Uh, and I found in my, in my own that the most significant contribution I can make to this event is, is in a, a very unique way. I have a unique ability and uh, a way to make things that are very redundant, boring, entertaining because of my wonderful personality. I find out from having seen other people that have made videos, and there's one right in the room, and I won't mention his name, Mike Giotta, that uh, when they do things, the camera work is excellent, but you gotta make it fun to watch because people get bored shitless. If your wife is watching this, ah, ah, you gotta make it fun. So, you guys are laughing, but what I really hope would happen, and I know at every contest lately, there's been four or five other people with cameras, they send me the footage, and it's like uh, not exciting because you gotta have that, that little, uh, it's really the word is bullshit that I'm looking for. You gotta make it entertaining and fun. And I know there's some people that are, maybe because of their religious beliefs, are a little offended by it. But if it isn't fun, you're not gonna watch it. And if you're not gonna watch it, you're not gonna learn. From these tapes, it's my feeling the most significant contribution I've ever made back to the hobby is through these tapes. Without the tapes, I would not be able to help as many people as often and, and make it fun to be. And if it isn't fun, you're going to get burned out and probably be hanging out in bars looking at naked women or something. So you really want to take, if you can, if you've never seen one of these tapes, some of the basic and advanced ones, take one home with you, see that I get it back. There's no money changing hands here. But please, get all your friends to watch it. You want to run off some bootleg copies, fine. If I find out you're charging money for it, I kill you. It's as simple as that. Now, there's a lot of people that don't know this information is available. We have just done a spray seminar at Scott Smith's. I didn't bring any extra copies, but very significant video. Uh, Scott's foam wing video if you've never sheeted a wing. Now, obviously, not everybody can live in this area and take advantage of this, but thousands, thousands of these tapes are out in the real world. I guarantee you people have learned. Not only learned, but they've enjoyed it. You, you have to be, Mike, you gotta make it fun to watch. You just can't take pictures of planes. The guys that do my, uh, they're gonna do VSC for me, two or three years in a row, made a VSC tape, showed every plane, interviewed people without talking. You gotta talk, you gotta ask questions. I'll put it in later. Yeah, so if anybody's going out to VSC, I'm looking for a new photographer. Rich, sorry. <laughs> no, but it's the truth, you have to talk. Mike, I wanna hear talking on that video. Anyway, if there's nobody has any questions, the stuff is over here. You're welcome to pour it. If you get caught shoplifting, Brian Keefe will beat the hell out of you. That's the end of it. Simple. And, and one other thing I can say over and over again. Please, 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 if you do nothing else from talking to me, the people that are in this hobby that are contributing, and there's a lot of them, Scott, Bobby Hunt's dad, everybody has put their heart and soul into making these products. And I think unconsciously one of the things we all do as suppliers is, is we don't try to compete with each other. In other words, if Scott Smith is cutting wings and he's doing a great job, 
I really would feel a little guilty about opening up Wendy's foam wing business. But what I try to do is carry some of Scott's products. I always have a wing or two laying around and try to make it that everybody gets a fair share on the profit and everybody gets a fair share of the recognition for the work. I've sold my stuff, obviously, Randy Smith, Tom Light, Brian Ether, all of the people basically have my stuff. And I have all of Tom Light's stuff and I want to put a plug in for the Tom Lay muffler. I've seen three or four of them here today. I went out to the field and flew it, did a pretty extensive test, and it is an excellent muffler. Uh, I would suggest everybody uh, that's running a side exhaust Super Tiger invest in one. It's a very light, well-made. Uh, I have one on my plane right now, for whatever that's worth. But uh, all of the little people that are putting up money to develop this stuff and, and do it, please support them if you can, and be fair about you should never turn this into a war of who's got the cutest belt crank or the shiniest horn or the best line reel. Support everybody. Everybody that's doing this work. If you had to go and make this line reel, make one and you'll, you'll die. If you had to take Delrin and start cutting these damn things out, about the tenth one you'd throw the piece out the window. Having this stuff available makes your life easier. I made, I bought aluminum and bent a gear myself one time. I bent 14 pieces before I got one that looked nice. The edge was saw cut. It took me hours to sand and polish it. When one guy puts up the money to make the die, support him. Buy it if you possibly can. Now, on that vein, and I want to, I know there's people in the room that can understand what I'm saying. I've made horns since God knows when. I just tried to make a deal, I, we, we closed the deal with Jim Hunt to make the little clips. He's already paid to make the die for the clips, and I know some people would like to have that included in with their horn, so all Wendy's horns will come with Jim Hunt little clips from this day on, or when it, whenever he gives them to me. But that's the idea. If everybody works together, I think the hobby benefits, and having this stuff pre-made, Randy put up a tremendous amount of money to make this spinner. Now, if I had to go spend a couple thousand bucks for material and, and run an NC program and everything, it's, it's really uh, a negative thing that somebody else comes out with the equivalent spinner and tries to undercut each other, and then I think the hobby suffers. So if it seems strange that I'm selling Randy spinners, Tom Lay mufflers, Jim Hunt's horn clips, and, and whatnot, and gear that are coming out of New Jersey now, the bottom line is if we all work together, the hobby will benefit. We'll all have nice stuff. It'll be fun to make planes. And anything that, if I start comparing my stuff to somebody else's, mine is better than yours, mine is shinier, fancier, better, it just turns into a negative thing. Everybody loses, but the biggest person that loses is the hobby. The hobby takes a beating, or somebody goes out of business with a bad taste in their mouth. I don't think that should happen. I know Tom Lay was annoyed that uh, people thought he was using Sun News to promote his whatever gas tanks or whatever. But I don't think any of that's appropriate. The people in the hobby are busting their ass to make things, and we're certainly not making enough money. Anybody goes outside, look at the van I'm driving, you tell me how much money I'm making. But this is good stuff. Having a line reels is a good thing. Uh, Scott stuff, uh, I carry Scott stuff, whatever. Okay, Scott, you're on. Thank you, Bert. First off, I want to apologize. I'm quite a little bit of a cold, so if I start coughing on you or whatnot, and I'm sorry, I'm throat lozenges. I'm not used to speaking with something in my mouth other than maybe my foot. So, I just want to tell you quickly uh, who I am. I'm, my name is Scott Smith. I'm the owner and operator of Aerosmith Model Aviation. Basically, as Wendy said, I'm primarily known for cutting foam wings and almost any foam core or foam components. Also manufacture the Prowler robot control line kit. And uh, I have a couple of little specialty items. Um, I have a belt crank that's for uh, plane bearing 40 size ships or smaller uh, that has standard type of stunt numbers. It's a four inch belt crank. I also brought along with me today copies of my videotape that Wendy and I made together on sheeting foam cores that covers both the epoxy and 77 spray and use of methods for doing that. Um, I guess the only important thing I'd like to say is I brought a few cores just as examples of some of the stuff that I can cut. I have Pattern Master sets with me, wing and tail. Um, I have an impact, I have a magnum. And I have one of the CD Max special wing cores. Just so you guys get an idea of what cores look like for those who haven't seen them. 
Uh, but I would like to tell you that I have somewhere between 300 and 400 sets of templates in stock in my shop. Chances are pretty darn good if you're looking for a particular wing that already have the templates. Um, they go back easily into the 50s. I even have templates for the original 52 Nobler. Some of the more obscure designs, uh, the old Ken High kits, uh, things like that. Uh, I even have templates for Vic's uh, F14. I've actually cut a couple sets of cores for that Vic, but I don't think they ever got built. Yeah. I think this is the only one that's been built other than mine. Um, Mike Frank, Mike Frank, or uh, right. uh, the 1980s. However, if you're, if it's something I don't have templates for, you send me your plans with your order. I can make up templates and cut virtually any core for you. Or if you're a budding designer and you want to design your own airfoil, same thing. Send me accurate drawings. I can make almost anything. All right. Uh, the one other thing I'll mention is along the same vein that, uh, that Wendy mentioned. Pretty much all of the cottage industry guys really do work together. Uh, I think it's common knowledge here that I've worked quite a bit with Wendy. We have products going back and forth at all times. And we talk a lot on the telephone, we work on projects together. I have the same type of relationship with Randy Smith. Same type of relationship with Bill Hopkins. Bob Hunt and his dad. Um, you know, they go on and on like that. One of the most important products that I have to give to you is my knowledge. I can either tell you how to accomplish, how to accomplish things if you're having a problem, or if you're trying to hunt something down, you're, you're looking for a particular product that you need to finish this latest ship. Because of these relationships, I pretty much know where you can obtain almost anything that you're going to need. Um, some of the obscure plans, I'm talking to people all the time who offer two or three sets of plans. That's all they have and they don't really advertise anywhere, but I know where you can get a hold of them. So if you have questions, don't ever hesitate to call or drop me a note and uh, I'll call you back. The answering machine's always on, so if I'm not there, leave a message. I'll return your call and I'll help you find the plans that you need, um, help you find whatever parts you want, or I'll give you whatever advice I can offer if you need building assistance. All right, that's about all I got, Rich. Here we have Jim Hunt. For those of you who may not know, it's Bob Hunt's dad. Jim's a longtime modeler and uh, the operator of CSC. First, I want to tell you what a wonderful hobby you have and how long I've enjoyed it. Would you believe? 72 years. Right. Hey! I would build a model airplanes when there wasn't any material. You had to go to a rug store and get a bamboo pole out of the middle of the rug that they wrapped it on, slice it, and then bend it around a candle and use Ambroy. You ever hear of Ambroy? Well, that was the only cement we had. Japanese tissue was two cents a sheet. And you got your bamboo for nothing. The Ambroy was 15 cents a tube. So that's when I started building model airplanes. Now a few things that you might be interested in. You know about my products. If you don't, you come back and look at it. I think we build the nicest set of hardware anybody in the business. A lot of people tell us that. A lot of kit manufacturers are now using it. It's keeping me busy. But that's all right. I just make more tools, more automation. Since I'm an automation engineer, it's not hard for me to make automated tools for my own business. And that's what I'm doing. Some of the things that we did in the early years, and he's talking about a wonderful hobby. I built a model, scale model of a passenger plane for American Airlines one time. I got a picture of it back there. $125. If that same model was built today, it would be $3,000. That's how much. And that, that those days, when I was a youngster, you could go buy a pair of shoes for a buck and a half, a tie for 15 cents, a pair of socks for 15 cents, a hat for a dollar, right? And a whole suit of clothes for $12. That kind of shows you what things were then. In fact, I built a little ROG, 12 inch wide, and made bent props for it, bent them out, and I soaked the prop, put an 18 inch blanket, and uh, water and saltpeter and oil.
and then put them in a little jig and put them in, in an oven at about 100 degrees. And they came out twisted and hard, and all I had to do was trim off the tips, shape off the back a little bit. So we used to sell an ROG guaranteed to fly, ready to fly, guaranteed to fly, post paid anywhere in the United States for 75 cents. <laughs> right? So from that on up to the point of where I got Rob flying when he was two and a half years old. He on his first trophy then, so it's in his blood. And he's now building the lightest, strongest airplanes anybody's ever built. And he got a new system for that. So I'm very proud of that. The fact that my grandson is a whiz of flying, and he's doing well. Now some of the other things that happened to me when I was a kid, and on up through the years, I built an outdoor tractor one time, 24 inches wide, 12 inch broad. And I was going to teach the kids in playgrounds at Louisville, Kentucky, how to do this. We did it underneath the trees and then on a beach, as long as it wasn't raining. And at the end of the summer, we had a big contest. Well, I went out to give a demonstration flight, right? Wound it up, I had the wings set a little bit too far forward so it could climb too fast. We all stood there and watched the thing climb out of sight, never saw it again. Rubber band power, 12 inch prop, 24 inch wingspan. Just a stick one. So I've had a lot of experience. Another one along that line, when I was in high school, I had a machine shop there that was better than any machine shop in town. It had the best equipment anywhere. In fact, some of the businesses used to come there and use some of our machines because they couldn't have it. They didn't have it. We had the best machines in town. So I did all the projects that they gave me to do in eight weeks. Well, I had 20 weeks to go. So the instructor said, what am I going to do with you? I said, I'd like to build a little one-cylinder gasoline engine. I got, the, in my, I think it was Mechanics Illustrated, had a, a set of castings and drawings that they sold you for $12. And I got that and I built the model in it. It was about three quarter inch board stroke, four cycle. We used a Prince Albert tobacco can for the, for the fuel tank. We didn't know. Nobody around ever done that around. So then I said, well, I've got to have a plane to put it in. So I built a six foot monoplane, carved the prop for it, put this Prince Albert tobacco can, which held about five ounces of fluid, right? And it didn't use much for this four cycle, right? So we took it out to the airport late in the afternoon and said, uh, okay, all the planes are down, you can fly. So I let it go, and it took off and flew in about a 200 foot circle and just kept going about five feet higher each time. It got up about 300 feet and those crosswinds started taking it west. Each, you know, like a buzzer, fly, go this way, go that way, and it kept going. Well, the airplane came in, and we said, do you see a model airplane out there anywhere? He said, yeah, about 15 miles down the river, it's still going. I never saw it again. <laughs> I don't know what happened to it. It probably landed in the river, but the Ohio River down there was quite wide. Now, some of the other things that's happened to me is uh, since I became, uh, I wanted to be an engineer. And my folks didn't have enough money to send me to engineering school. I wanted to go to MIT, the worst sort of way. But I had a little model airplane business and I was selling gap tissue and cement and rubber bands and things like that, pins and whatever else they needed, balsa wood. I was the first guy in Louisville, Kentucky to cut and sell balsa wood. And I ordered a hundred board feet from a place and transportation company in New York City. And it came down to one bump, about so square and different place. Railway Express brand brought it in and had the whole thing on his shoulder. A hundred board feet of false foot. It was about three foot square and very slings. So we thought that's pretty neat. Let's take a picture of that. So I got a picture in the newspapers and from then on I was in the newspapers quite frequently because I was doing something different. And the model airplanes and the contests and everything, I had no trouble getting publicity. And we had a lot of fun. So I've had a lot of experience in this, and now I'm building hardware for you control, bell cranks. Uh, I'm going to soon be building adjustable rear elevator horn. I got a sample in my pocket. I'm going to make the dial down and start making it. So uh, every once in a while, we'll add a new item. I just added one last night. Uh, a fuselage jig for making your fuselages nice and square and straight. I built one for my son 24 years ago. 
And a lot of the people that used to be members of this club used to come down and borrow it, build a fuselage, bring it back. I don't know how many fuselages that original jig is made. But I finished up the first one of the new run last night, and it sold already. I talked to three people on the phone, I sold three more. So I guess it's a good item that we'll keep building on us. If you have any questions about the old timers and model airplanes, I even have the uh, form that I spun the first aluminum cowling for the Galloping Comedian when Red Reinhardt worked for me and he built that airplane. So I can still spin cowlings for the Galloping Comedian. That goes back a few years. That was, uh, well, I see, I built the Travel Air and had it model airplane news at least, I think it was January 1952. So it's an old-time stunt. It's 500 square inches and only weighs 34 ounces. Oh, you guys that have heavy, air, heavy airplanes weep a little over that one. And it's, that was built in 1952. The deal with it I built, same thing, except it's one ounce lighter. And if I'm going to build another one, I'm going to make it two ounces lighter than that. I'm going to stay under 30 ounces for 500 foot square inch air, 500 square inches. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. I could stand up here and tell these stories for hours. Got me high that lot. For instance, Rob, my son. <coughs> I had little half A jobs. OK motor, tester kit. So we used to put it on 20 foot lines and fly it in our front yard. And he, he got interested in it. He wanted that airplane. So I set him on my arm and gave him the handle and he flew at two and a half years old. Two months later, we went to a contest. He was the youngest contestant at the contest and won his first trophy at two years and a half. Now, you may not like me to tell you that, but I think it's pretty good. So I've been around a long time. I've seen a lot of things. Some of the things that's being developed now, uh, like the new wing system that my son has developed, a 710 square inch wing, ready to cover four and a half ounces and as strong as anything you can find. And don't forget, flying control line model airplane, you've got a weight on the end of a string. The more weight you have, the harder it is to turn it. So the lighter that airplane is, the better it's going to perform. But it's got to be strong. So you've got always this thing making it light and keeping it strong enough that it won't come apart. When you start to take an airplane that weighs 50 ounces, around a corner and try to make five foot radius corners, forget it. It's going to keep going. It's hard to keep those airplanes performing well when you got a lot of weight on them. So the answer is less weight and just keep up the strength and the accuracy. Anything you'd like to ask me? Anybody? Is your son going to start Selling these wings built up? Yes, he's uh, he's selling the patterns for him now that you can build your own wing. Okay. But he's not going to construct a wing. No, no. No. Do you have to uh, We're going to make videos on it, and you'll have those. We're working on that. Hmm? No. I've got one of the fuselage fixtures back there that I've made. I finished it last night. Sorry, so. So, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Jim, talking about weight to power ratios, what do you think the uh, maximum allowable weight should be for half A? The ship, uh, say, was about 27 or 30 inch waistband. Just roughly. All right, we found out that the the ratio that you want to shoot for, and this is hard to get. Let me tell you. Is an 049 or 050. 10 ounces per square foot. That solve your problem? Go and check your airplanes and see if they're down to 10 ounces per square foot. If they're not, if they're down to 10 ounces per square foot, it's going to fly a heck of a lot better. Okay? Anything else? Okay, Tom. have something real quick that when Jim talks about that lost foam method of building airplanes that with Bobby Hunt building the foam jigs, uh, the Falcon over there was done that way and it's the best wing I've ever had and my new airplanes has been done the same way. I, I highly recommend it to anybody 
it uh, just makes it easy. Tsunami's the same way. Tsunami too, yeah. Excellent it's just great though. because you, you have a cradle and all the contours and the, everything's in the right direction, right where it should be. So it's really great. Uh, I just have one thing real quick. There's two books over here. I'm going to put them up front. And it's a, it's a very good collection. It's not all of them, but it, it's a, there's a lot of the classic era airplanes in those two books if you want to see what they look like. Uh, because uh, there's a fidelity to, to the original design has been added to the classic event to cut out the cheating. And uh, you don't have to have documentation, but if you want it, it's right there and I'll be glad to, you know, to make copies for anybody. Also, uh, personally, I have probably about 50 different airplanes to plan, uh, for the, the plans to about 50 different airplanes and I'll make them available. And then I'm hoping by about this time next year, uh, I'll, I'll probably be have a sideline business of my own, which will involve uh, doing computerized or AutoCAD drawings for anybody who wants their airplane done. And then the, the big thing right now is it's lunchtime, guys. Hey! And uh, I know hey, most of it's out here. The pizza's not here yet. But I think everything else is there. Is is Jared? Uh, is Peabody? Does Peabody have anything else before we? Where's Peabody? Who cares? Who cares, right? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, I'll leave the books up here for anybody who wants to look at them. All right, this is Gary Lutz's uh, personal album, and you can just flip through and describe what's on it. Okay. Obviously, Bob Giesky. Yeah, Bob Giesky at the uh, 74 Nats. Okay. Um, this one here was... Uh, no, you only can do this page face, and then we'll go back and refocus for that size. Okay, just do this page face. Billy Suarez, the Mass Cup winner, probably beat the shit out of me that day. Who's this? Wendy and Dave Cook. And, uh, okay, look Dave at me, Pitchley. when I was young. <laughs> Huh? Okay. And uh, this just uh, Billy Suarez is a 85 jet. I'm not okay. sure which one it was. Uh, yeah, that's the 60 jet when it was new. Yeah. I don't think it's all the way finished yet. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There it is finished with the first paint scheme. And I think he changed that paint scheme a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, is that the team trials? Team trials. Uh, I don't remember what year that was. This is up at Coxsackie. Yeah. Yeah. Just return them. The championship. The the world champs. There's three takes there. No, just take one. That's the world champion. Yeah, yeah. It's the world champion. Take it and send it back to me. Okay. I know you got. I know you're gonna cut my string of lettering out next year. <laughs> I'm waiting. Everybody's telling me, oh, can you do this? But I never hear from them. I so. just gave a guy your, your phone number. I, uh, I gave him that whole spiel because he wanted to make fancy lettering. All right, obviously Suarez when he was younger. Yeah, Suarez younger and... Uh, and when he was older. Right. He looks better younger. <laughs> All right, good guy. Okay, this uh, picture Bell Reed at the Johnsville meet. And uh, this picture here, I'm not sure what plane it was. It was at the VFW uh, Clifton, New Jersey stunt form at 93. Well, I don't, I can't identify it either. Um, of course, Carlos Serra, Jr. Joe Ortiz, the Joe. bombastic one. Uh -huh. Mike's old plane, right. the old 46 ship. Okay, Suarez's, Suarez's ma Magnum. Uh, there he is, John DeTavio. That plane looks just like mine. He refinished it perfectly. <laughs> the, old, the old frying pan, right? Yeah, the old frying pan. <laughs> okay, uh, Midgley's East plane, nice, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, Carl Rachel's. Carl Rachel's, right. It's a bad Adam Musco. You, you should always, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the end of the film, it looks like. Yeah. Mike Pratt's plane, that was nice. Uh huh. And this was also at the uh, uh, Muncie, Indiana, on their, in their open house that, that year. Yeah, right. Okay. I'm not sure which plane this was. Uh, 
it was a plane that was built by Dan Winship, and some fellow there had bought it from him. I, I, yeah, I don't, that I don't recognize right off yeah. the bat. That was also at the Muncie Field. Uh, Mike Karavich's flying van. Yeah, that's a good one. I had chores all day. Damarell's plane, a profile. A lieutenant. So there's a lieutenant, yeah. I'm not sure who had this. That's point. Dave Knowles. That that originally was Dave Knowles' plane. I sent some pictures of that to Win Paul too. Uh -huh. He didn't know whose it was. Okay. This looks like uh, Harrisburg. It was a Harrisburg meet, yep. right? Yep. I flew that plane. It flew well. Mike giving his demo from a couple of years ago. Right. For a 46 size ship. Yep. That's a pretty plane. Yeah. Real nice. That's a 46 size pattern master. Okay, there's the old 20 pointer. Yeah, the 20 pointer. Steve's, Steve's plane, Busso's plane. And this is Billy Suarez's plane in uh, when he's filler. Finishing in oh, okay, during building finishing. up the substrate. Right. And here's a picture of it at the. Uh, yeah, this is the bottom. Awesome, huh? Right. Awesome. Okay, here's a couple of Suarez's jets. Ah, uh, the old P38. Yeah. Uh, plans available from Gross Nun Products. I still have the plans today. Awesome. That's my favorite of the twin boomers. Uh huh. Okay, these are construction videos of my first pattern master. I remember you sent me a set of these yeah, pictures. Yeah, geodetic uh, elevators. Yeah. This is plain. This is the uh, green PM. This is the green PM when it was okay. in. Uh, this is bare wood. I I'll take this. that back. That was silk sand. Yeah, I remember. Before this. silver. Here it is silver. in green. And then uh, painted green, but no panel lines or anything yet. Yeah. It's all light coat. No, no, uh, the top. Yeah, it was all light coat, undercoating, and then done with sig, uh, uh, sig colors, and then with uh, 380s. Uh, 380s clear, okay. Right. Okay, there's just some more construction videos of the fuselage. Okay. Carved wheel pants. Oh, the Sidewinder. Side oh, my God, he's got a picture of Sidewinder. That's from the old house where I had the mirror in the bedroom. Right. Awesome. You know your stuff, boy. <laughs> I don't care what, what Damarell says about you. <laughs> okay, these are some real old pictures. A picture of the old uh, Midwest Cougar with my sister holding it. Yeah. It must have been 14 years old when I built that. And she's 72 now. Yeah. <laughs> old Twin Panther? Yeah, Twin Panther. Oh, I my God. 219s. Uh -huh. Unbelievable. Yeah, they are the Torpedo 19s. Yeah. yeah. There's a picture of my father's uh, airplane. It's a new that looks like a lot of work. It was a lot of work. It was a scale. He liked control line scale a good bit. Of course, the old Sig uh, Acrobat. A couple more construction videos. Yeah, right. Wendy's way of doing tips. Yep. That looks real nice. The finished product. Oh, it is. Well, when we go to the other side of the album, we'll get Jim holding it. Okay. Tsunami lives. Oh, Adam Musco. I remember this day. Uh -huh. Adam Musco, the killer. Look at this. This is one of the really nice. Obviously, he has set the trend with that sawtooth look. That looks nice. Oh, it's sharp. But Adam Musco is okay. I don't care what they say about it. Look at this. He wouldn't give me that plane. That's last year's thing for him. I begged him. I pleaded with him. Pretty aeropath. Flies well, too. Steve DeJulia, the finishing king of Pennsylvania. Oh, my God. Steve DeJulia. Look at that. Awesome. And this is a Al Reed down here with yeah. Suarez's version of the Pattern Master. Yeah, I flew that, too. That flew well. That's how our planes together. Yeah. I flew that in Harrisburg. In fact, I wish we could uh, set up a contest down here. This is Andrews Air Force Base, and we got miles and miles of... Well, set up a contest. Yeah, he'd like to. Shit, sh just do it. <laughs> Big Jim. Big Jim. And this is also down at Andrews Air Force Base. Yeah. Is that where Al flies? That, yeah. It, it's, it's a huge mechanic park. I've got all yeah, kinds yeah. of You can put five circles down there. I hear that. It's all fenced in. Okay, 
here is a Chuck Holt sample of Craig Gunder. Yeah, old Chuck. He's a good one, Gunder. And uh, this is a little uh, get together we had at Harrisburg, being as they stopped the. Uh, yeah, I come down having a contest this year. They're not having a contest this year. I don't know why, but so I've gotten together with uh, Gunder and Holt Apple and Jim Tate, a few others. We have a little. Yeah. Have your own private con We used to go out fun to Holtz fly. Apples and just have fun flies. Yeah, a couple well, times a year. Down here at, at the school yeah. down there. Exactly, yeah, school where they used to have the contest. Uh -huh. Yeah, we had a good time. Chuck is a good host. Big mask, we lose those. Uh, yeah, the 11. pink guy. Uh -huh. Vigilis playing. Vigilis Look at that wild neon. He's a wild man. Oh, this is Coxsackie, okay. Yes. Yes. And, uh, Jimmy's playing. That's the one Borelli had. Yes. Joe Ortiz is playing. Uh -huh. Misty. Borelli's other playing. Yeah. Is this Chuck Holt sample Squire. Yeah. Jim Tate's new uh, hype chair. Yeah. Nice lighting. Nice paint job. Billy Suarez. That's my plane, just before the crash, I owe Wendy a prop. <laughs> you owe Wendy your life. <laughs> Remember me and your will. <laughs> and then just uh, yeah. okay. re rebuild and refinishing. And that's... Uh, Great, okay, that's now let's end. flip to the other side. Hold on, let me refocus here. My uh, finishing after uh, the crash last okay. year. Okay, this is after the crash. And I talked to Midgley, he said never do this again, start using aluminum foil. Aluminum foil is better, that's well praised technology, that works well. Because this bleeds, if you drop some paint, if the gun spits, if, if bleep, you, you get a big block on there. Right. Aluminum foil is so much, just don't squeeze it down into the paint. Right. Hey, tradition. <laughs> just can never seem to get away from tradition, you know. Lampion's playing. This is a Jim this is a nice Tate picture, yeah. With his I never saw it playing in real life. It looks nice there, though. It flies beautiful. Yeah. These two, I don't know whose they were. I'm not familiar with it either. This is one of the guys from Fox Acting, by the way. And this is uh, Beldor's plane. Okay, this is a bad Pete picture. Moscow. Pete Moscow. Sure, on this one. Midgley's playing. Cardinal Sin. Lampion's playing for sale. Yeah, that yeah, was funny. <laughs> he sold it, though. I did. He dumped it, yeah. For a thousand. Dump is the better word. Yeah. This, is, this is one of my favorites. That Adamusco knows his stuff. I don't care what Damarell says about him. <laughs> oh, there's Damarell. Where's my pizza, Damarell? Don't burp on it's video. Coming. All right. I want to tell you, we've got such a pizza coming. Well, pizza. bring one over here. <laughs> <laughs> don't be bashful. <laughs> Food is on its way. Who would want to eat anything else when there's pizza available? Uh, right. Is that a beauty? Look at the profile. When you're flying it, this thing looks so cool. It really looks nice. Old tsunami. You see that six foot tsunami we're building down in the cell? Oh, George, oh my god. That, it, it's a scale. It's not a sponge. It's a scale. Nice. The fuselage you could sit on. It's so big. The James. Big Jim Greenaway. Yeah, he likes that PM. I know that. He likes, he likes the PM. Architectural rendering. That's how the pieces come together. That's all there was in the kit. What I developed the construction photos. Here's a good one. That's a nice photo. That was taken. That'd be a nice one to send in the stunt news. That was the last contest on it. That Edison? No, no. this was at uh, PA, Harrisburg. Oh, okay. It shows you a rib and a few some old timers. Yeah, the old Midwest Mustang. Aries and the old Nobler. No, no. Remember when you could buy these kits for $10? <laughs> Forget it. Nothing's ten dollars. the kit plans plus tracings, but he never saw an engineer. It's good that you take all these constructions. Though. It's helpful if you, if somebody asks you a question on building and you can show them in a picture. It's real right. helpful. 
Carey. Yes. yes. Need your signature. Okay. On this IOU. Don't ask, just sign. Just sign. Bruce Stecker had a heart attack, or a, I don't know, a near since, miss anyway. Stecker is going to get a set, a, a set of these videos, we can say all nasty things about him. <laughs> Stecker. Well, he had an angioplasty. Bruce? Yeah. 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 Oh, two weeks ago, I guess. Ted Heinrichs talked about it this morning. He's home. Yeah, he mentioned it on a... You know, he's, he's laid up and all. Let me sign it here. Bruce Stecker? Yeah. And he was going to go out to the... Uh... Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's scrapped. Gee, that's a shame. What? Who's there? Bruce Stecker. It must have happened this week because we just we were. Didn't last you just say him? Really? Were you? Stecker, we love you. Don't believe what they say about you behind your back. It's all true. All right, more Gary's things. Suarez with his custom Harley when he was a Harley rider, with extra stripes on it, extra paint, extra everything. Billy and Terry. Uh -huh. It's a beautiful plane, no doubt about it. Yeah. Front row plane. Okay, so finish work on his yeah. yeah. John D. thinks he's a he thinks he's going to the ghetto here with his hat on backwards. Mike's old, the snowbird. The music calls the snowman because it was all white. Yeah. Then he had Octopussy that had the thing on the bottom, the big eye, the, the creepy guy. Maybe that's the one that is with, the, with the creepy eye on the bottom? Oh my god. This is better, Mike. Stick with that paint job. Stick with it. This was great. I was there when Jimmy Casal dropped his sunglasses right through the guy's tail. Oh man. And then he's sitting around looking like, oh, I can't believe I did that. We caught him. Go oh, Harrisburg pictures. Yeah. Very little escapes the evil eye. Mike Ravage. Believe it or not, this is one good flying plane, too. I'm guessing it yeah, he flew it down the field. Yeah. Jose Modesto, Voodoo Child. You know, I, I, I can't see. I, 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 good set of pictures. You know, Glad you get this on. Square. See, now, the great thing about having this on video, you lose this album on the way home. Who cares? Do you need more copies? You got it. Yeah. You can't make copies of these pictures for what I can make tapes for. Forget it. Billy again. Where's the pizza? Hey, uh, you got it? Well, why aren't you bringing me some out? What, I didn't pay my 15 bucks? So what's the deal? These guys have, you can't believe it. They're, they're torturing me. They don't have, no pie for Wendy here. They know I haven't eaten. Well, I'll see who my friends are bring me some pie. They know I have to work during lunch. Is that your plane there? Is this mine? I don't know. Let's see. No, that was Billy's, but is that yours there? That's the side one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a tragic year that was. Oh my god, that was the year they didn't have the circles cleaned. What a mess. And then I became the bad guy for complaining. So I'll go about 10 minutes Never complain. Let's eat. Time for pizza. Good album. Thanks for letting me videotape that. Hey, Wendy. By the way, we decided not to pull this trick on Banjak because he's a nice guy. Banjak, you're safe. We were going to hide this plane under a garbage can and then videotape him. We decided not to. There he is, right there. That is warm. You try to get this guy in business. You try to spruce his business up. Instructions on that? They're stealing that. Go away. Listen. Go away. Just Mike, come, just come here. I got you a customer. Did you deliver? Or is it going to be? Now you're on video here. Let me show you how to sell videos. Step into my your attention, please. You got videos for me for free. Can you give this guy some love? We want to get this stuff. Let's see. Get the show and already get here. You want to sit down? And the first thing we want to do is like to everybody. <laughs> It's the results of the Northeast Slash Championship Series from last year, 1994. So, uh, will everybody get up here, please? Russell, eat your heart out. Mr. Awesome Card here. Yeah. I love it. There's a bird on the tail, is it? Bill Lennon. Can you get the guys in here when you get the awards for the last year? Get the lettering. Check the lettering out. Is that dynamite? Oh, what a... No, it just 
That is definitely awesome. Six inch wide piece of balsa, you can get three ribs. Right through a lot of wood. You know what I have in my cellar now is a seven foot wingspan scale tsunami. I heard about that. Awesome, awesome. It's like this. Mega parts. It's over a hundred dollars for the top one. I had to make a seven pieces. What, a single, a single <laughs> yeah. Can I borrow these? Absolutely. Are you going to help just yeah. mail them back or give them to me? No, I didn't see him either. Okay. First place is going to surprise everybody because I think it's great. Uh, this is one of the up and coming champions, guaranteed. And he just bumped up from beginner. So, believe it or not, first place in the Northeast Stunt Championship Series in intermediate is Brian Kiefer. Hey! Brian. Get those guys in here, will you? They're missing. Where's Brian? I think you better hey, stop around here. Boy. Now, Brian, there are more important things than girls, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Watch it, Brian. They just want your money. <laughs> the Northeast Stunt Champion for Intermediate, Brian Keeper. In the advanced category, and here I know it, I think everybody's here. That's great. Third place in advanced, Joe Ortiz. Advanced. And he helped give a demo before, and he's not expecting this either. Don Herdman. First place in advanced, and he's over there holding up the building against the pole. First place is Don Chiodo. Nobody here that won expert this year. Ooh. We don't have to give that out, right? <laughs> anyway, expert third place is not here. Is Bob Lampion? Second place also not here is Bill Suarez. Billy. And first place, this guy paid off the judges because it seems like you got that. He's right. got to be paid off. <laughs> Gotta be, because he doesn't know how to lose. That's right. Which means he's paying them off. It's got to it. be favoritism, you know. And uh, absolutely, he's actually playing both sides against the middle because he, he flies sixties, but he has Bob Kiesky's type in his in his back pocket. <laughs> Keep digging, Tom. Paybacks <laughs> are a bitch. Tom, that's not his pocket. <laughs> First place expert this year, the Windy Ardnowski. Hey! Now again, 
uh, we're going to need more, more donations in order to take care of a perpetual plaque. Uh, so we're going to hold off on that award until we get it. But the grand champion I might add last year came out of the advanced category was Jim Damerill. This year the grand champion is Wendy. Ah, let him pay for the trophy. <laughs> we, we might make him pay for his own trophy. This gets better. <laughs> I thought I'd pay for the uh, last one. What, what we'd like to do is have some special artwork done so that we can silk screen it on it. And uh, we'll, we'll have to work on it. Just make a perpetual trophy. But we'll, we'll, we'll be working on this to see what we do for it. Okay, uh, does anybody have that Joe has? So, here's Joe Alamusco. Hey, thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Joe Alamusco. And uh, while I'm waiting for these pamphlets that I uh, made up to get distributed, uh, you know, maybe I'll just make a couple comments here. That, to say that I'm happy to be here, this is my fourth stunt forum. And uh, I remember the very first one that I attended. I tried to share some information that I, you know, maybe developed or uh, help in a process of making rib templates and I've always enjoyed being asked to come up here and do things. But uh, today, my subject is going to deal with a, a method, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a slight cold so if I start to cough and gag a little bit, that's the reason. What I want to talk to you about for the next 10 minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, is a method for shaping curve control surface traveling edges. Now you may be aware that I've, uh, over the past couple of years, really got involved in trying to develop an elliptical shaped wing that, uh, you know, is straight, lightweight, flew halfway decent. I've made progress on that, but one of the things that is a spinoff for that that I'm going to share with you today that I think can, you know, relate to classic stunt type airplanes, uh, old time stunt airplanes, or any kind of an airplane where you have a curve control surface that you maybe somehow figure, well, how am I going to do this and how's it going to be shaped up to a point where it is even and uh, kind of fits your qualifications for craftsmanship and so forth. What I want to share with you is at least my idea, and it's only one of maybe hundreds uh, on how this can be done, but I've had great success with this. So if you have a pamphlet, you can kind of follow it with me. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by reading to you, but I'll try to demonstrate this one-handed. That's the uh, microphone here in one hand kind of increases the air of difficulty, if you will. But, uh, the first thing you have to do when you're shaping a curved control surface is uh, you know, consider how you're going to go about doing this. If you're an expert carver and sander, like Wendy is, and the kind of work he can do with a, an exacto blade on a flank piece of wood, it's amazing. I've never really developed that kind of skill. I always had to depend on a jig or some kind of a tool or instrument that would help me guide my cutting surface, whether it's a knife or a tool or a sanding block, to obtain that nice straight edge. But when you get to a point with a curved surface, if you're trying to develop a, a flap such as what I've developed here, and by the way, these are flaps uh, for an airplane similar to my stuntress that I had here in the form last year, uh, it becomes a little more difficult to try to get that trailing edge tapered evenly from the tip to the root. So what I've come up with was an idea where I could take a, the plan form of my uh, flat outline drawing, cut it out with a pair of scissors, blew it up on a piece of uh, white pine, which is very easy to work with. You try to find a piece of pine board that's straight, doesn't have a lot of warps in it, is free of cracks and twists, you know, things that would be a nice unit to work with. Paste up the, uh, the cutout outline of that, that flap or elevator or rudder or whatever the curve control surface is, and then take it to a saw. If you have a band saw, that's nice. If you have a hand coping saw, you can use that. Jigsaw, saber saws, anything to get that curved edge cut. By doing that, then you sand it to a nice shape uh, along the, it's hard to demonstrate this here, but along the trailing edge to get it to shape to the contour of your plan form. Okay. Then once you've done that, this will give you a base that's your blank 
uh, flat material or control surface material that they can rest in. Now you have to decide, well, okay, how thick am I going to make this control surface? I like to work with quarter inch uh, control surfaces for flats. A lot of people like 3 8 I've seen folks that do it with half inch or let's say that you want to do a curved uh, elevator surface. You may want to work with a half inch material, maybe even 5 8 Once you determine the thickness of your leading edge, the object behind this type jig that I've uh, come up with, and it's nothing new, I'm sure Jim Hunt and a lot of others have come up with jigs very similar to this, is uh, I take a piece of uh, sheet metal, usually about 22 gauge or something uh, about in the thickness of a car fender on the kind of cars we drive today. And you might ask yourself, well, where do you get a piece of sheet metal like this? Well, it's probably as close as your local uh, refrigerating, uh, air conditioning installer, their sheet metal shop. They'd probably be very happy to just let you go through their scrap box and pick up a couple of scraps of strip uh, sheet metal that is close enough to 22 gauge or a few thousandths of thickness and take it home with you. And you can use that by drilling holes to it. Half inch seems to work pretty good for a uh, trailing edge. Three quarters of an inch for a leading edge. You can simply put your, this is a hard part to do one handed here, but you cut a blank of, in this case, quarter inch uh, material for a flap out of quarter inch, quarter grain. And it's a good idea, this is just a tip, and it's uh, something I learned from Wendy that I've had great success with, is always to try to have the grain in that wood uh, as parallel as you can get it to the trailing edge. With a straight taper flap, it's pretty easy to do. With a curved trailing edge, uh, you kind of have to hit the happy medium, you gotta get it right in between. But once you have that blank cut, you simply insert it into your, uh, your J, of course, I left out this step, and this is the reason I do these pass outs, because I, I go blank sometimes, follow procedure steps here, but uh, you drill holes in those sheet metal strips, you can use small nails, and I've indicated the size of the nails and the size holes you can drill and all that, or you can use these bulletin board push pins to hold your strip into position. Now, in this case, I like to use, for at least this jig, and you're welcome to all look at this, the leading edge of the flap, in this case, is a quarter inch material, and I like to have my trailing edge at an eighth of an inch. So that means if I bend in my sheet metal strip on a trailing edge, it's gonna be dropped down so I expose an eighth of an inch of the trailing edge of this curved flat balsa blank that I have in the jig. Then by having this in position on the table, I take a variety of sanding sticks. I use blocks also, but I find it Sanding sticks work very good for me. It's almost like using a handheld file. And uh, a 60 grit, an 80 grit, a 40 grit to maybe begin your cuts. And uh, by the way, uh, if you're allergic to balsa dust like I am, you might want to use a, a respirator or something to keep the dust out of your nose. If you have a sanding table like uh, Wendy demonstrated earlier, that can be helpful on collecting the excess dust without getting it in your uh, respiratory area or all over the house, but let's say you don't put a respirator on, it's a good tip anyway. And you start by using your, your coarse grain uh, sanding material, abrasive paper, it can be uh, aluminum oxide or garnet type paper, and you can very simply adhere it to these sticks by applying a surface of uh, rubber cement on the stick or the block, one surface, and then on the back surface of your abrasive paper. Wait a couple minutes till it kind of gets tacky and just put the two together and you got yourself a, you know, a sanding stick. And uh, when it wears out, you simply peel it off and do it over again with more rubber cement. Works pretty good for me. So what I do, I hold the jig and I start working at the trailing edge of the, uh, the blank that's in the jig. And I grind it down, being careful not to take too much material or put scratches all the way across the material. And then as you start to shape your trailing edge, you want to move to a little finer grip. Again, this is nothing more than another sanding stick made out of a fur strip material. I've got 120 grit on one side and 100 grit on the other side. You can final sand this using the sheet metal limits on your leading and trailing edge. There's limit guides. And as you start to feel your sanding stick 
scratch across the surface of the sheet metal guides. You have to be flat, you have to be straight, and it gives you a pretty nice finished result. When they're blank, you're satisfied that it's uh, pretty much sanded to the contour and the uh, surface condition that you like for the jig. You can simply take the blank out, place it on a flat table, or that sanding box that will inhale all the sawdust or sanding dust and take a, a longer straight edge like this little T-bar. And again, I use that rubber cement technique to apply the bracing paper and finish sand the unit to you know, the surface that you like. And this is probably a 220 grit that I like to finish with. Now, I asked Jim Borelli uh, not to come up here right now and demonstrate this, but later through the series of uh, time that we have this afternoon, Jim's going to take this blank that's in the block and he's going to work with some of these sanding sticks, hopefully put the respirator on if he's allergic to dust, and uh, shape himself a nice set of flaps for that new elliptical wing he's been talking about building. So I'm going to try to give him some incentive to get that thing going one of these days so he'll have a pretty good set of six pound quarter grain flap with the start. So that's about all I really wanted to talk to you about. The uh, little brochure of three plates blank that I passed out to you, I think show some sketches or examples. You can follow this, put it in your file. And of course, if you ever have a question on what to do any of these things, just give me a call or drop me a line. I'll be glad to help you. So with that, if there's any questions right now, that I'd be willing to answer. But you're going to actually watch Jim do this thing on a table in the back here. So you might be interested in seeing that. So until I have a chance to talk to you the next time, uh, live to fly and fly to live. Why don't we get Jim Borelli up here and haul this stuff away and go build flaps? Where's Borelli? Joe's going to tell us about his airplane. Right, this is another little tip I picked up from Wendy. Matter of fact, the big tip is laying right in front of you. I have <clears throat> Wendy and Big. A lot of the other fellows in this room have been uh, very influential on me learning how to build these kind of airplanes. <clears throat> and I'm trying to get better every year. And uh, hopefully you know this. 10 years from now, I might be really doing something here. But Wendy showed me this little tip where you have your airplane on display on a table like this. You know, you have the wheel with the wheels all wheeled up and or you roll off the table and you simply take a piece of quarter inch balsa and cut a little slaughter hole in it so that it can fit right under the landing gear of the wheel and then it acts as a wheel chop. It also works if you have a vehicle big enough to have this laying flat on the surface in the back of your van or a beautiful van that Pete Lady that we up here in today. Uh, it was like a small bus, really. It had a nice flat space in the back. You simply chalk your wheels to those little uh, balsa chocks and the airplane doesn't go anywhere. It really works out good. <coughs> okay, a little bit about my airplane. Uh, this is Mr. Awesome. And, uh, you know, that name does not imply that uh, I'm Mr. Awesome anymore. But I fly like Mr. Awesome. Sure it does. Uh, <laughs> Reno Air Races, I always had, a, had an interest in them, and I know Wendy has, and you look at some of the names of these airplanes, and, uh, and that's pretty much how I came up with this one. I knew that one time there was a Reno racer named Mr. Awesome that crashed, the pilot walked away from it, but I thought that was a nice, neat name for an airplane. It's not machine-like, it uh, kind of gives a little personality. Now, if this airplane ends up flying like a, a slug, it won't, you might not see Mr. Awesome out there on the Mr. Sluggo. <laughs> But uh, I think it's going to be okay, and essentially the reason I, I, I feel pretty positive about that is because it's, a, it's basically a Cardinal, which you know is a, a windy, big Jim Greenaway kind of design airplane with a, a kind of sort of pattern master wing. It's a little thicker airfoil, but it's essentially the same airplane as my uh, 1993 
uh, cardinal that I had at this stunt for him. Same airplane. I like the wingtip shapes on Wendy's uh, tradition, so I decided to, okay, try my hand at copying that aesthetic curve. If you look at the profile of this airplane, it's uh, just about identical to my Stuntress. That's the elliptical shaped airplane I had here last year. So I combined the two, and I, what I'm really looking for is to come up with an airplane that is kind of my visual signature, something that when you see, you're going to know it was mine, because it will be my own styling, if you will. Uh, for me, a change of pace is I, I now have an airplane with landing gear in the, in the wing. This is a big step up for me. Uh, basically because of the flying fields that uh, I don't have access to that are nice smooth paved surface. Usually I have to fly off the grass. And uh, this airplane has provision, as you can see under my left hand here, for a few spotted landing gear. So uh, amphibious or ambidextrous, or I could go both ways here, okay? I could have the gear in a fuse and in the wind. Uh, another thing that's different on this and my other airplanes is the fact that this, the stab on this is a geodetic stab, meaning that it's made out of basically uh, quarter grain 16 sheeting with zigzag geodetic ribs and a trailing edge sheeted top and bottom. Comes out extremely light, extremely rigid, and uh, that's something that's really important. You never want to have an airplane that's too tail heavy. This has quarter inch flaps, built up wing construction. The probably an overbuilt to some extent because it has spruce spars that are carbon fiber laminated. And that's total overkill. I could have saved an ounce on this airplane by eliminating that style of spar for this kind of wing. But it has the uh, big GMV deflector air duct through the bottom of the airplane here to help cool the, the Hemi 60 that's in here. And, um, that's pretty much it. One thing that Wendy challenged me to last year was to put the name on the bottom of the airplane, will you? So I, I did. And I'm glad I did. And I'll tell you why. Because by putting that uh, Mr. Awesome logo on here, I'm glad I did the bottom first. Because I had uh, you know, experienced a few of those air pulling problems, those little you know, bumps that you have to go over to get something, the techniques ironed out first, although the bottom come out. Good. The top of Mr. Austin came out a little bit better because I had a place to practice, if you will, for the the initial stenciling. So, by the way, on that, I, I started out with a uh, Frisket paper, which I had great success with in the past, but as you start to get in very elongated, wide open space, thin line lettering like this, uh, it gets to be a little rough to get it all in alignment and get stuck down in one, one place uh, evenly. So. I ended up using plain old Xerox paper, the same kind of paper that you have, that little write-up that I passed out, and I just cut the stencil out of that and used a low-tack 3M artist adhesive spray to spray on the back and stuck it in position and got the old airbrush out and painted. So that's about it for the plane. It, uh, right now, as I'm holding it right here, it weighs 62 ounces. I know it'll pick up some weight with tip weight and a few other things I may have to change on, a muffler and so forth. But, uh, Later on in the year, we'll have a chance to see how this flies, and I hope if it flies as well as my Cardinal, I know I'm going to be a happy pilot. So, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Yes, sir. I'm your cowling. Uh, the cowling. The cowling is attached with two hold down screws just behind the head of the uh, engine, if you can see. That's uh, Wendy's patented. Uh, be a small hold down now, technique, works very well, doesn't come loose, easy to take off, service the engine and so forth. And uh, that's all that's holding on there, two eighth inch sets, nothing in the front. And uh, of course you can see the bottom of the fuse is flat. And it makes for a rigid construction, it's simple. And uh, although the airplane internally is not that simple, it's you know, just a Big old sunship that, uh, you know, anybody here can have some fun with it. If you want to spend 700 hours to do one like this, it's, it's all it takes. Actually, it take, took me about five and a half weeks to build the airplane. The rest of that time was, uh, you know, sanding and painting and rubbing and doing all the rest of it. But that's, uh, I had more time to build and fly. And it, 
just in case you're interested in this, uh, I can, with my schedule and family commitments and so forth, I have about 30 hours a week to spend during the winter building a bunch of what have you on long airplanes. That's a pretty substantial block of time. Conversely, my flying time during the year, and uh, you know, I look this up in all my little log books that I keep on my flying sessions. I only get out to fly 15 to 17 times a year. Okay? So if I'm lucky and I get out on a Saturday and a Sunday, that's two flying sessions a week. That's really great for four hours of time. So I don't spend as much time flying as I've been building. Well, I tell you, I'm looking forward to the day when I can, you know, retire or be on a job where I don't have to work 40 hours a week or 56 hours a week or however it works out, maybe spend 30 hours a week flying. That's when the really fly, flying to live part of this thing is going to come into view. So thank you for your attention, and I'm going to take time away from the next speaker here because uh, there's more interesting topics and subjects to get into. Great job. Thank you. Okay, as we get set up, our next uh, speakers are uh, Jimmy Damwell and Tom Hampshire are going to talk about old-time stunt. A significant... about some of the flying characteristics of them and whether plants are available and like that. Why don't you go first? You give the history. Yeah. So we don't get the microphone on the right side, and we're not really too squared away. We probably smile a lot more than, rather, than, than a lot of the other phases, though. So I'm rather happy to be out with ancient stuff. You've just seen Joe Adam Musco's craftsmanship. I'll be the first to tell you, I can't begin to get close to that level of quality. It's just fun for me. Maybe someday I'll get real pumped up and serious. Till then, I enjoy myself. You've also heard from, from Joe and from Wendy and from Vic and from the other Pampa guys, all of these examples of success after success after success. I've always found that I do a little better by learning from the mistakes that I make. And I make them by the gallon full, by the catalog, I got mistakes. The first one is this thing. This is the first, the, the, the first OTS legal airplane that I ever built coming back to the hobby as an adult. I had ringmasters and such as a kid. This thing I picked out because I thought it was pretty. And you build it with silk and dope, and it's old timey and it's pretty and all of that. It's a terrible choice as an airplane. Two guys that I know, Danny Banjock has one and Doug Benedetti has one, both of which have ignition systems in them. What it's got wrong with it is the wing. And if you look at it end on, you'll see, it's got two things that you really don't want. The reason you don't want to build one of these is it's got a very thin airfoil, it's got a very sharp leading edge. Both of those characteristics mean that as soon as you load it heavily in a turn, the wing stalls, the flow separates right about at the leading edge and it doesn't turn. So in real world terms, this thing can get through an OTS pattern. The best I ever did with it was I think I got third at the 20th anniversary of Old Time Stunt five years ago this coming fall. It does lack for turn. This one is light and straight, but in the, the second half of the outside, in the vertical eight, every single time when you get it right over your head, you're going to start cranking in the down elevator and you're going to be flying it on one line and by the time you finish to get it to come inverted at 45, you're going to be flying it on one line and you have the handle down someplace around your knee. And then you take a step back and you do the inside. Uh, if you like the look of it, and I certainly do, I, you know, warts and all, all scarred and old and crunchy looking. Uh, if you like the look of it, don't build one. Instead of building one of these, build yourself an F&B Viking. 
It's a dead ringer for the fuselage configuration, but it's got a wing about twice as thick with a nice blunt leading edge. Real good choice, but don't build yourself a zilch. The only exception to the zilches that, as far as I'm concerned, is the one that Bob Zambelli mentioned, the Wee Duper. That's the only, that's a, an 09 to 10 size airplane. That thing has a wing twice as thick as anything else that Safdig ever designed. He designed that one in 1951. He had to have known how much better that thick wing worked. And for some reason, it never got adopted. And he built the expendable and all of the later stuff when going back to the thin wing. Why is a mystery to me. This next one is one designed by a true genius. You're not gonna find anybody any better at this stuff than the guy who built this. The guy who built this was Red Reinhardt, who I knew only slightly as a youngster. The way that I knew him was that one day in 1958 or so, I was flying at Rich's Hobby Town, and Skarinzi was there, who I thought was just out of this world, and somebody showed up. I didn't know this guy. His name was Red. And when he showed up, they made this big fuss over him. Red's here. My God, you thought they were going to fire up the orchestra. Red's here. Red's here. Red's here. Larry commences to have Red fly his airplane. This guy had not had a handle in his hand for about three or four years. And he took off from a hand launch, flew one lap level. It came around. He did a wing over. And he pulled the reverse wing over out with a rudder in the grass. And I thought to myself, geez, that guy is either good or lucky. Real lucky. And then he did it five more times, and I went away thinking, geez, this guy's good. This guy's really good. He had an excellent hand. Once stunt airplanes started to go slowly, he kind of dropped out of the picture. He wasn't around. Once flaps and the nobler style of flying came into vogue, he really wasn't around. In his day, flying 80 mile an hour stunt, apparently this guy had eye-hand coordination about like the kids that, be, that get to be experts with video games. He could just lit a whisker with a model airplane. He did a spot landing one time that left the airplane standing on its spinner in the middle of the spot. And he looks over at the judges at the mirror meet and says, well, fellas, you think you can find a way to dock that? And there it stood, in perfect. This thing is, is a, a, a real slinky looking airplane. The trouble with this and the trouble with all of his designs is that he did, in his head, without any computers and without any mathematical training, a very, very elegant stress analysis on the wing. I don't know if you can see through the silk, but if you look at that main spar, it starts out being three-eighths of an inch thick at the wing root, and it's tapered forward to be an eighth of an inch thick at the tip. That means that you build the wing by first building that very elegant tapered spar and then cutting each rib in half, gluing the back half onto the back of the trail of the spar, the front half onto the front. Then the false ribs go in, then the leading and trailing edges go on, then the cap strips go on. Lastly, he did something that, that I don't know if there's anything else that has it except the Frisky Pete that was published with it. Instead of leaving the trailing edges hang slack, his plans call for shear webs at the forward of the trailing edge. And if you build the wing the way he tells you to, it's a very tough subject. It's very, very difficult to build it accurately. Once you build it accurately, you got an absolutely beautiful wing that'll never warp and which has the happy property of having the strength and the weight concentrated in the middle. Instead of having top and bottom spars or a D-tube where the tip of the wing is as heavy and as rigid as the root. He didn't believe in that. He put the weight at the middle of the airplane and let the tips flex. You can make a zilch work with monocoat. This thing, if it's filled with reason, this one is heavy uh, because it came from a kit that was a gift from a buddy and I was obliged to build it. If you build this the way he intended it to be built, you had better silk it because the, the silk is an integral part of the structure. This is a good OTS airplane, but not the absolute best. The best that I've ever flown, and it, it's a little bit scarred and slashed now, is this thing. This is another 
Reinhardt airplane, a 1950s Plymouth Internets winner. It never had a name as such. It's not a Wizard or a Whistle King or a Stunt Shamaz or whatever. It's the 50s Plymouth Internets winner because he took it to the Plymouth Internets and won with it. This one is pretty greased up because I made Damarell, Niebuhr, Peabody and Company royally mad at me by putting a diesel in it, which never worked very well. If you like to annoy yourself, I would heartily suggest that I have a PAW-19 diesel that's for sale, or if you, uh, if you want to bargain hard, you can probably work out a cash bonus if you'll come cart it off the premises. Uh, the diesel oil eats stuff. This airplane is an even tougher subject because if you look at that configuration of the planking, there's a 16th inch vertical spar through the middle of that wing, but the D2 is tapered. Okay, think about that. The way that these guys built these things, Reinhardt and Scarinzi, they built these things in the air. They didn't have fixtures. They didn't know about lost foam or building boards. They would start out with the spar, draw the lines on it, cut a rib, cut the dividing line on the plans, and glue a half of a rib in place. And they would continue that process until they had the ribs assembled to the spar. Then they put a piece of the trailing edge on, the other piece of the trailing edge, the leading edge, then they put on the sheeting. All of this is done in their lap. There's no fixtures. I have sat and watched them do this, and I can't do it. I can't explain it to you. This one was done in a lost foam jig, and that, that makes the whole thing very easy. It makes it idiot proof. All you do is follow the template lines that the foam cuts generate for you, and it works. If there's anybody here who gets to the point where they can build one of these things in their lap the way the old masters did it, come on up here because I'm ready to listen again and maybe I can even figure out how they did it. This particular one, it's a little shop worn now. This is a real good one. It weighs 22 ounces. It's got a, as, a, as it stands now, it's got a little Fox 25 in it. Uh, this is pulling away the best OTS airplane I've ever flown, including borrowed flights on other airplanes. This thing is real, real good. The price that you pay for that is structural complexity. This is not the airplane that a guy who'd like to try OTS for the first time wants to build. This wing's that, that, that wing will eat you alive unless you have 20 or 30 ships under your belt. It's a real tough subject. What I would suggest for somebody who'd like to just start out come out, fly OTS, enjoy themselves, and have some laughs, is one of these. This is, uh, whatever it is, PDQ Models, Millville, New Jersey. It's the name of the company, Super Clown, okay? Their quality control was absolutely awful. It looked like their stuff was cut out by beavers in the woods after dark. Just horrendous, it's like Sterling, only worse, just awful. This one is scratch built from plans. The reason that I would suggest this is, number one, the absolute dead simplicity of it. It's a sparless wing, because of that you should silk it. You should not expect that iron-on coverings will make it hang together. The other thing that it has, uh, relative to the circle burners, rules of OTS, the way we go about it, is this is one of the three airplanes that has on the original plans a mention that the flaps are optional. What that does is it means that if you build one of these things, you can fly it in whatever pamper class you're in. Mike Costello does that. But you can also take it and arrange a linkage gadget. I'll show you how to do it afterward if anybody wants to pursue it. Uh, you can arrange linkage so that you can disconnect the flaps and lock them in center. That means you can enter phase one and phase two with the same airplane. Not a bad way to go if you want to get, a, you know, a good amount of use out of one airplane. You're going to have at least as much fun fooling with old stuff as you will uh, bringing it out to fly in contests. The other thing I'd mention about this one, this is real light. This one is about 19 and a half all up with an old Fox 25, it was an RC one that I made a Venturi for seven bucks at the junk show. 
I haven't found any place better than I can spend seven bucks than buying one of these at the junk shop. Structurally, this is an interesting one because aft of about the high point of the wing, you'll notice that the fuselage is very square. The typical profile, it looks kind of crude. The reason for that is that after the high point of the wing, the fuselage is a foam composite. It's just a piece of foam cut to the outline, faced all the way around, 16th balsa on the sides, end grain 332nd top and bottom. So you can't sand it to that rounded contour, but you're going to take about an ounce and a half out of the airplane building it that way, and you'll also get very acceptable torsional rigidity after the trailing edge. Like that. That means that the tail will not flex to the same extent in this airplane that it will with a balsa wood profile. That's something that in my own feeling my way through this stuff, I'm pretty sure is important. Everybody thinks that profiles are terrible because the engines don't run. That's true. You can build, with, you put enough fiberglass in it, you can get the nose rigid enough to support an engine run. I have a couple of them that give the, the, the motors work, but I'm satisfied that if you really whomp it good in a hard square corner, you can make the airplane flutter because the, the body after the trailing edge lacks torsional rigidity and the tail surfaces are walking around on you in the middle of the corner. As soon as you take and, and, and let off on the control, it comes back together and it starts to fly again. But while it's in the corner, you can upset it. You can, you can knock it pretty far off balance by hitting it hard. That's what I have. Jim, over to you on less questions. Steve. No, that's internal. Okay? You're entitled to make any internal strengthening structural changes that you want. Okay? Dick. Yes. As far as I am concerned in it, you, can, you know, if you get rulesy about this stuff, you take all the fun out of it. As far as I'm concerned, yes, you could build that airplane with top and bottom spars, a C tube, a D tube, do it any way you want, and you don't have to honor it. I honored it because, uh, you know, to me, I am still to this day in awe of the guys who can build those things in the air, gluing one piece together at a time. I don't know how they did it. I, it's, I suspect it's like a musician who looks at a Stradivarius. You have the thing, and you know it works better than anything that was ever done, any time before or after, and you can't figure out how he did it. Same thing if you're, a, uh, if you're a furniture buff. It's the same thing as looking at something that Chippendale or Heppelwhite did with his own hands. You look at that, you look at a modern day shop with computer controlled wood cutting machinery, and it's still not as close. They're still not as precise, and it's just a mystery to me. It's the wonder of the ages. How did they do that with an X-Acto knife and nothing else? I don't know. Jimmy. Thank you, Tom. And as far as the craftsmanship goes, if you're looking for a reproduction all-time airplane, I'd say this is about as far as you're going to get. They don't need to be any prettier or fits any better. Uh, I just wanted to touch on a few things. Uh, they wanted me to do a little bit on the history of all-time stunt, but without John Mist being here, I didn't want to bother defecating that. I did want to point out that 25 years ago, John Mist decided it was time to go back and fly the old airplanes again and have some fun with them. And he started all-time stunt in this club in 1970. We had the first contest, which means rolling around this fall, I'm sure you've heard about it, we've got the 25th anniversary contest for all-time stunt, second weekend of October. We're going to make it a big go. We're going to try to get people in from all different parts of the country. Find a ringmaster. Come on out and fly with us. There's flyers outside for it. Uh, Tom talked a little bit about the availability of airplanes. I wanted to make sure everyone had been looking in their last stunt news where they have this beautiful pictorial, strangely enough, all about old-time airplanes, covering up to about 1951, I believe. Uh, you guys have all seen that, I won't bother you with that, but then I come here today and on sale from Pampa, old time stunt construction drawings. This thing has every published design for control line stunt with a miniature plan from I believe it's 1947, this book goes up to 1952. Anyone looking for something that everyone else doesn't have, you'll find it in here. This plane's in here I've never seen. 
And I've been to all-time contests, as has Dick Woolsey, from one coast to the other. There's planes in there we've only dreamt about. Now, I know earlier we talked about uh, how many advanced expert flyers we were. I found out two-thirds of the audience here was below that. Is there anyone here that doesn't know what we're talking about with all-time stunt? Is anyone unfamiliar with Class 1 and Class 2? I know we just glazed over that. Basically, Class 2 is an event run only in the Circle Burners uh, Club right now, and it's for airplanes with flaps. And then there were quite a few of them designed pre-52. Uh, the original Nobler falls in that category. This is the original Smoothie, the Chief. But as Tom mentioned, only the uh, Sterling Mustang, Sterling Yak, and the Flying Clown are the only three we know of that were options on the flaps. And if you've ever seen John Linderman fly his drone diesel prepared Super Clown, he has a system where he simply just hooks the flaps up to a push rod and flies class one, and then hooks the flaps back up on the airplane and flies class two with the same airplane. Has a lot of fun with it. The other thing I wanted to touch, especially for the beginners out there, is the old time stunt pattern lends itself quite nicely to people just learning how to fly stunt. And even though there is a Pampa beginner event, strictly because of the round maneuvers and the way the pattern is flown in old time, it blends right into how you learn how to fly. Most people, the first maneuver they learn, once they have control of the airplane, they start doing climbs and dives. That's part of the old time pattern. The next maneuver people move up to is loops. There's round loops, part of the old time pattern, not combined with inverted flight, executed by themselves, five of them concentric loops. When you get to the eights, most people, when they learn how to do an eight, first thing they learn is the lazy eight. Half an inside loop into an outside loop. Again, that's just the way it was done in the original pattern. So it's a much smoother event for someone to start in. And I think it's the perfect first rung on the ladder for you guys that have been building planes and enjoy flying them and just want to come out and try your first contest. A, because we're not serious, we have a heck of a lot of fun. And B, the planes are easier to fly and the pattern's easier to fly. I know there's a lot of people that come to the forum. There's a lot of people that come out and fly airplanes that we never see in contests. And I just want to make sure it's emphasized. Talk to anybody that's been to Tucson, anyone that's been to our all-time meets, anyone that's been to John Linderman's all-time meets. We have a lot of fun out there. People plant airplanes, you laugh about them, you pull them up, you clean them off, you fly them the next round. Because they're not meant to be super ultimate, precise, super light airplanes. They survive a couple of bounces, they keep on flying. They're nice square straight wings, anyone can build them, anyone can patch them, and they get right back up in the air again. It's also a good basic way to learn the fundamentals of model airplanes. Before you get into trick mufflers and trick motors and trick motor mounts and strange construction, go back and learn it the way the masters did it. Learn why you've got to make a strong fuselage. Learn it in an airplane where the motor is upright and accessible and you can see what's vibrating and what's not working. I learned more going backwards and building the old planes than I ever did trying to figure out the new ones. Because like everything else in this world, you find out if you don't know the basics, the advanced stuff doesn't help you much. You just keep falling in potholes and you go back and learn them. And these airplanes are one hell of a good way to do that. That's about all I got to add, folks. Any questions on old time while we're up here? And especially any questions you have about the, the contest in October, talk to us today. Any special suggestions? This is still definitely in the formative stages. We may or may not be having some special events on Saturday. Yes, Joe? Most, most, con if you have a plane that you own back then but it is not qualified, oh, non-builder of the model rule. Uh, this tends to be a club-to-club -club thing. I believe in the original Circle Burners rules, it is not specified, correct, or is it? It didn't say... At, at the time the event started in 1970, AMA had Builder of the Model Rule for all events, and no one overrode it then. No. Nowadays, it's common practice that if you want to come out and fly, come on out with the airplane and fly. Does that... I don't want to answer. I would, yeah. <laughs> I would echo that, and I would say that you will occasionally run across people who, who want to debate what's legal and what is it in OTS. Can I add graphite? Can I make a spar here? Can I, can I brace this up inside? As far as I am concerned, and I think I speak for the circle burners generally in our efforts with OTS, as far as we're concerned generally, run what you run. If it's not an outright cheater with a stretch tail moment with tune pipe, you're going to be able to fly it 
And if somebody shows up with a, the modern day Planck Ringmaster or shows up with an airplane they didn't build, as far as I'm concerned, the name of the game is to get the airplanes in the air and fly them and let's see if we can enjoy ourselves. And if it, if it gets to the point where it has to be rulesy, well, then we'll worry about them. So far, manana has stretched for 25 years and we haven't had to worry about it yet, so we're not worried. Come on, the Sir? Is, is the foam wing internal considered a change in internal construction? Technically, it's an internal modification, and it is legal. Actually, in the initial article by John Mist, I think foam wings were mentioned as not being legal. This again gets into the same boat as the new style Ringmaster with the plank leading edge. It's been claimed that that airplane is not legal, but the only difference is it's a plank leading edge. Uh, as Tommy said, come on out, bring it, and fly it. If you get serious in the event and you're up flying near the top, you're not going to want to fly a plane that's not, you know, as someone said, you could build this Internet's winner with a D2 wing and spars and everything else, but when you get to the level where you're trying to recreate the era and not just come out and play, then you don't want to do that. You want to build the real plane. And you'll find, you know, you want to come out with a plane during this, or you want to come out with a four wing airplane, you can fly it. And you could, no one's going to say probably anything bad against it, but as, as you get serious in the event, I don't feel it's what you're going to want to have. But by all means, now, come on out with it. Yeah, see. Uh, like the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord was built a couple of years after. Well, it's a solid leading place. Quite a few years after, yes. Yeah, they had one with a bullet-like leading edge. By Sterling? By Sterling.